I ended my introductory lecture with the Emperor of Constantine's conversion to Christianity, but warned that we needed to backtrack to the period before Christianity received first imperial protection and then imperial adoption. Most of the very early Christian art that we have comes from the catacombs, or tunnels and rooms carved into the limestone tufa beneath the city. These are very cool to explore and really give you a sense of the secretive, embattled status of the early church. The picture on the right gives you a sense of how the catacombs look today, although electric lighting does take away something from the experience. This is not our required work, the catacombs of Priscilla, but it's quite similar. And I kept this slide because it contained so many useful vocabulary words and so that I wouldn't have to rework all those circles and arrows. Polygonal frame is a term that's now used in computer graphic design, and it means just what it sounds like, a geometric shape drawn around a painting or design, in this case an oval that contains a spoked wheel pattern of paintings. An orant is a figure with both arms raised in prayer. A lunette refers to a semicircular space, often above a door or a window, and often decorated with fresco painting or mosaics. I'm going to say relatively little about this required work since it was so well explained in the Khan Academy video, including why I labeled this so-called. Let me repeat a point I've made before, but one that's especially important for this unit. You're going to be looking at a few works, specifically a few great churches in depth, and we're going to rely heavily on homework to cover other works. If you skip the homework and the College Board decides to use one of these images for, say, three or four questions, you could find yourself seriously messed up. Note what looks like architectural features along the walls is actually just a painted surface. So where have we seen this before? This is first style Roman painting and we saw it in Pompeii. So what is this painting showing? The conventional interpretation is that we see the dead woman in three stages of life, getting married on the left, raising children on the right, and praying. That is the orant pose in the center. Note the modeling of her face. This is more three-dimensional than much of the Byzantine painting and mosaics we'll be seeing soon. The Roman painting tradition, as exemplified by the famous portrait from Pompeii on the left, is still alive and well. In the pendentives, those are the somewhat tri triangular corners below the shallow dome, and in the shallow dome itself, we see doves, a symbol of peace and the Holy Spirit. We also see peacocks, which I've now learned are a symbol of eternal life. The College Board has never really explained why it chose this work and not as well known as some of the catacombs and frankly harder to get information about. But one theory that popped up on the AP discussion board may be the reason why this work showed up on the list. It turns out that these particular catacombs have been the center of a controversy over, over whether they might demonstrate that women played a different role in the early church than was generally believed or that the Catholic Church teaches. So here's another non-required painting from the Catacombs of Priscilla. The figure on the left, shown breaking bread, has been identified by dress and hair as female. Could this mean that women served communion? Of course, we don't know that this is even a painting of communion. It could be depicting a funeral banquet. The images also led some people to suggest that the central praying woman, Orant, is actually a priest. Since the other paintings in the set show her as a bride and as a mother, this strikes me as a little far-fetched. Vatican archaeologists have responded that the painting, like many in the catacombs, shows a deceased person entering paradise. The hands raised in prayer are common features of catacomb art. Still, it's easy to see how the Orant might be thought to resemble a priest. At any rate, I want you to be aware of this debate just in case, and if you'd like to know more more, I've posted two articles about the controversy on Moodle. This required work is frustratingly degraded and blurry, but there are much better good shepherds in the catacomb of Priscilla itself. Go figure. You need to be aware that Christ the Good Shepherd is one of the most common themes in Christ early Christian art. The early images of Christ almost all show him as a beardless young man. They also often show him teaching his disciples, much as Socrates and other classical era teachers discuss philosophy in the Agora or Forum. I tried and failed to find close-up photos from the required fresco, but the Old Testament scenes apparently include Adam and Eve, remember Christ is the new Adam free from sin, Jonah sitting under a plant cursing Nineveh, Jonah too was, Jonah too was buried for three days and in a sense resurrected, Moses striking the rock to get living water for his people, and finally Abraham preparing to sacrifice Isaac as Jesus sacrificed himself for humankind. 
Here's a famous Good Shepherd mosaic from the Western Roman capital of Ravenna. Okay, fasten your seatbelts. We are now entering the period of the course where you will start to collect a portfolio of churches and downloading a lot of architectural terminology into your mental hard drive. So let's get started by reviewing the basic Roman basilica, which was the basis for many of the imposing churches built in the reign of Constantine and his immediate successors. So what is this? It's a reconstruction of the Basilica Ulpia from Trajan's Forum, which was not a church, of course, but a public administration building. So why did the now imperially approved Christian church adopt a basilica plan? Well, they needed a space that would hold a lot of people. They also wanted to convey imperial approval for the new religion and, using a famous imperial style, helped send that message. They needed a longitudinal plan leading to an altar. The basilica's long nave and apse, now relocated, served that well. The Khan Academy video about Santa Sabina mentioned Old St. Peter's. Here's a floor plan of the long since demolished church with some helpful labels. Note one very important departure from the basilica. Worshippers entered through the narthex on the short end of the rectangle. This led their eyes immediately toward the altar, which was the focal point of worship. Another innovation was the transept. That's the hall perpendicular to the main hall or nave. As you'll see in a minute, your required early basilican church, St. Sabina, did not have a transept, but these would become common elements of Christian churches, not least because they transformed a basic rectangle into a building shaped appropriately like a cross. Trust that you watched the excellent Khan Academy video on this church because I'm going fast. So what kind of columns do you see? They're Corinthian. Note the acanthus leaves. These were taken from older Roman buildings. The term for architectural recycling like that is spolia. And where have we seen this before? How about the Mosque of Cordoba? So what basilican features do you see? There's a high flat roof, side aisles with a lower roof. You can see them sticking out in the photo of the exterior and a rounded apse at one end. Here is Santa Sabina's floor plan, another required image, but without those useful labels. This is not a required image, but the carved doors of Santa Sabina are some of the oldest surviving works of Christian narrative art, and the panel on the upper left, which I've enlarged, is the earliest surviving depiction of the crucifixion. In 330, Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire east to the town of Byzantium. He wanted a fresh start for his Christian empire, and Rome was filled with monuments to pagans and to pagan gods. But the move also reflected geopolitical realities. The west was increasingly under siege from Germanic tribes. The east was richer than the west, and therefore more important to defend. And let's face it, Constantine did not suffer from a deflated ego. He liked the idea of having a capital named after himself. Constantine died seven years later. The next really important uh, Emperor is Theodosius, who ruled from 378 to 395 and declared Christianity the empire's only legal religion. He destroyed many pagan temples, holy sites, and images, and even disbanded the Olympic Games. Kind of a spoils work. Theodosius divided his empire between his sons, one of whom moved the capital of the Western Roman Empire to Ravenna. Since it was surrounded on all sides, either by the sea or by swamps, Ravenna was easier to defend from the many Germanic invaders, and it was closer to the eastern capital of Constantinople. We're going to come back to Ravenna, but first let's move into some more Byzantine history. Byzantine rulers were a mixed lot, but they all ruled as head of both the government and the church. The struggles between popes and kings that would define much of Western European medieval history had no real parallel in the Byzantine Empire. Patriarchs were important personages, as were bishops, but when emperors said jump, they pretty much asked, how high? The two great Byzantine churches we will look at, one today, one tomorrow, were both commissioned by Justinian. He and his Empress Theodora, shown here in mosaics from San Vitale in Ravenna, were rather a piece of work. Let's watch two clips from a video about the Byzantine Empire. The first gives you some background on these two rulers. The second video clip starts off just after a major riot against Justinian's rule, mostly sparked by the very high taxes he imposed to pay for his military adventures and for his ambitious building program. Another example of art, possibly destroying culture, are coming close. Justinian wanted to cut and run. Theodora 
former circus performer, prostitute, and all-round tough broad, as we'll see, had other ideas. The video leaves off with an introduction to Hagia Sophia. We will spend almost all of the next class on this incredibly important church, which we've already encountered in our Islamic art unit as the inspiration and goad to what famous architect? Sinan. But we're going to end this class by looking at Justinian's second most famous church, San Vitale in Ravenna. I did not assign this Khan Academy video because I wanted you to watch it and discuss it in class. You will read about both of these churches in your next homework assignment, and there will be quiz questions from this video as well as the reading. There is a place to take notes about all of these points in your workbook. Remember, this is a College Board favorite.